So, dear audience, as dean of the faculty, I'm delighted that you have come to another opening of Theologie Interkulturelle, Intercultural Theology, today. And, of course, I'm also very pleased to welcome our guest today, Nora Nonterra. But, of course, I'm pleased to see all of you, every one of you, and especially I'd like to welcome also the director of CIAF, which is the Centrum für Interdisziplinäre Afrika Forschung, den Herrn Kollegen Hahn, but all the others too. A lecture that is entitled Unpacking African Theologies, Intersections of Religion, Gender and Social Cohesion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, good evening to everyone here. Um, I am glad to be with you. And thank you so much for the warm reception that I have received so far from all of you. Um, I'll try to be slow as possible because I get feed feedback that I am often very fast when I am speaking. So when I'm a little bit too slow, it's just a response to that feedback that I got. You can feel comfort comfortable to give me another feedback that I'm too slow, and then I'll try to see how I can um, come back to normal. So actually, I like to let people know about my name first when I encounter them. So my name is actually Nora Kufonotra. This is my, these are my names. My family name is Nontra. Now, because Kufonotra is normally long, there is always a temptation to see it as a family name. So because of that, I abbreviate it as K. So most often you will see my name spell as Nora K. Nontra. So it's just the case for the uh, Kufonotra. When I got an invitation to come to Frankfurt to encounter this department from the context of a, an intercultural theological perspective, and of course from my own experience as a, a theologian who is a lay, who is a woman, who is from Africa, I had to ask myself, what will be of interest for me for an audience like this. I found it quite difficult to put my finger on something, but in the midst of that confusion, I got help. Which was, there is a need for us to first of all try to unpack what we understand by African theology and what is playing out in African theology today. And so I came up with this topic on packing African theologies and looking at the intersections of religion, gender, and social cohesion. Today is just an introductory lecture, and I have titled my introductory lecture as African Theology as Abundance of Life. I don't know how you do it here, but this is intercultural learning, so I think I'm just going to do it the way I know how to do it, and then we pick it from there. Again, I'm open to feedback if it is not okay. So I would like to start with a story. And the story, at the end of the story, comments are invited, if you have any to give me. About two years ago, in Kumasi, Ghana, where I lived, I met a young Ghanaian woman. And whilst we were seated outside of her house and trying to have conversations just about ordinary daily life, she mentioned to me that, ah, it's about time for me to go to church, so I'll have to soon prepare and leave for church. And I said, oh, that's good. You like to go to church? She said, yes. And I said, oh, great. She said, Nora, we have to thank the white man. I said, what has going to church got to do? We have to thank the white man. She continued, because 
they brought us God. They helped us to know God. And I was confused. The discourse on African theology is characterized by a question. The question is this. Is African theology or African conception of God and of his worldview antithetical? Is it opposing to Christian theology or to the gospel message? This is the biggest question in African theology. Now, the question can be understood from two perspectives. The first one is the so-called missionary or colonial Christianity. We have probably heard of John Samuel Mbiti, one of the famous pioneers of African theology. He says that Christianity of the missionaries was not from the start prepared to face a serious encounter with the traditional religions and philosophy. In other words, it made no use of the existing philosophies, the existing religious expressions, the existing linguistic worldview of the people when Christianity came through the missionaries to the continent. So there was some kind of discontinuity from the historical and indigenous encounter that people had with God to some extent, at least as it was taught to the people. There was also what Kwesi Redu would prefer to call a kind of silencing the linguistical interpretations and philosophies of people. And Kwesi Redu is a scholar of around the time of the struggle for independence who would go to school. And in his university education, no mention of the word African philosophy. Not even in philosophy course. <laughs> no talk of the other fields of study. And unfortunately, the experience of Kwesi Redu still lingers on that you'll be running a university course in Ghana, in other parts of Africa, and you probably would never hear the word African philosophy. I call this situation a kind of a non-incarnation approach to theology for the African people. From a Christian point of view, the person Jesus Christ came through his incarnation to, to, to mix up with the people, to purify cultures, and as he himself said, not to erase cultures or traditions. And so wherever his message goes, in my opinion, it is supposed to penetrate, purify, and transform the cultures of those people. However, with at least the complaints that we got from our Panian African scholars, whom I agree with most of, uh, to a large extent, we did not have that incarnation happening. We had a kind of an attempt to replace instead of purifying, instead of transforming. So, on one hand, you have this concern that gave birth to what I call the decolonial wave. The decolonial wave. A very strong wave that came alongside the struggle for political independence on the continent. Again, championed by scholars, and I would like to just pay homage to a few of them. John Samuel Mbiti, Mercy Oduyeye Amba, Kwame Bediako, Lorente Mageza, and so many others. They desired that African theology disentangle itself, detach itself from a mindset, a framework that has strong colonial impositions not the philosophies of colonial systems, 
not a linguistic worldview of a foreign culture, but that African theology can use her own philosophy, her own religious expressions, her own linguistic worldview to understand what the gospel means for them, especially today. Therefore, there was a strong calling among these pioneer African theologians to differ from interpreting the Christian message through a foreign lens. They said, no, we cannot continue on this trajectory of interpreting the Christian message or the gospel message through a foreign lens. Ignoring and being part of a process that seeks to erase a kind of historical consciousness of a people. And so we need to, to, to defer from that. We need to move away from that. And I like Laurentin Magaza a lot, so I use a lot from him. For him, he did theology in ways that elucidate the core values of the African indigenous religion. And this was actually done by most of the pioneer um, African theologians. They said, what are the core values in the African indigenous religious knowledge and expressions that already existed among the people that made meaning to them, that gave them a sense of being, that made existence meaningful to them? How were they relating with God? And he says, all these pre-existing indigenous conception of God, of religious expressions of Africans, cannot and is not inconsistent with the Christian message. Therefore, the pioneers of African theology gave a gift, in my opinion, to young scholars like myself to stand on that and build on in a way that the Christian message can be relevant to the people based on their own philosophy and their own religious expressions, but also their own needs. And so it is at this point I begin to ask myself, what did the conception of religion bring to this whole discourse, especially from the indigenous perspective? I look at, first of all, religion. The argument of African traditional uh, theology, African theology is that we should posit the African worldview, traditional religion, as a pivotal point of reference for African theology, which means that we should not be afraid to pick the elements, the values, the belief systems in the African traditional religion that are helpful for us in uh, constructing a theology that meets the needs of the people on the continent and use it. We should not be afraid to do that because the emphasis is that this is not necessarily inconsistent with the gospel message. And then as we journey on throughout the course, I shall pick specific topics that would help us to see how the core values of the African indigenous religion is really not, to a large extent, inconsistent with Christianity. We need to be critical about the use of and how the term religion is defined as a distinct phenomenon independent of culture. So on the question of religion for African theologians, it's not just a question of what the religion is, but even the definition of what religion is. In itself, not African. And pioneer African theologians are encouraging us to question that. And I'm conscious of that when I use the word religion. What does it mean for me as an African? 
my uncle in the village would not understand the concept of religion as we use it today. Because he has not been to school, so he has not really had, I mean, the opportunity to go through Western form of understanding the world and the academic terminologies that we use. Religion, for me, or for an African, penetrates every aspect of the person's life. It is not a distinct phenomenon. It is a spirituality. So you can actually talk about African spirituality. Life, birth, death, agriculture, economics, you walk on the streets, you meet your friends, I am in this room. It is not distinct. I don't have to leave this room. I don't have to leave my encounters with any of you to experience God in the church. In African sense of spirituality, there's no sharp distinctions in, of, of that sort. There's no sharp distinction between the profane and the sacred. There's no sharp distinction between the spiritual and the non-spiritual. Because it is total, the, the, it's, it's, it's part of the whole. And so, for us to look at religion in African theology, African theologians are actually encouraged to question what religion is today. Is it okay for us to proceed with such a conception of religion? When I talked of the intersection of religion, gender, and social co cohesion, the gender aspect that I thought of to bring to bear in this whole discourse of African theology is that when the pioneers of African theology came up strongly to say that, no, let's make use of what we knew and what we know. Women began to be part of the theological discourse on the continent. And I'm going to limit myself today to just one of them. And so in order not to dilute her message, which we shall be looking at, especially in our seminars, I just pick a few quotations from her. And she is Mercy Amba Oduyoye, who says that since in the church in Africa, men and the clergy presume to speak for God and to demand the obedience of women, it is not easy to experience God as empowering and liberating when one is in the church's ambit. Women experience God as the one who orders their subordination, who requires them to serve and never be saved. God is the one who made them women with a body deemed to be the locus of sin and impurity. This is a concern that Mercy Amba Oduyoye is drawing our attention to. It's coming from the inheritance of what we got from Christianity mixed with existing cultural issues. And we are doing theology, and who is going to draw attention to these issues? It takes a woman theologian to do that. So women began to join the discourse and saying that we are joining this discourse on African theology, but we are not joining this discourse to just continue with the way things have been. We are joining the discourse to mention things the way they are, to give names to the issues the way they are, so far as women issues are concerned. And she's one of the first African scholars And she dared ask these questions. And this is the gift that African women theologians who pioneered theology are giving to young women like myself to stand on 
So again, there we have something. And I'm going to continue again with Mercy Amba Oduyonye to explain the central theme in African women theology. The central theme, in my opinion, is this, as captured very well by Mercy uh, Oduyoye, who says that for many women, however, this is a clear substitution of the will of God. So referring to the previous experience that she Ablai explained, that is a clear substitution of the will of God for the will of the male of the human species. Many women experience God differently and cannot allow themselves to be subjected to cultural codes that mask the image of God in women. They experience God as empowering them with a spirituality of resistance to dehumanization. And this is the part I like most in this quotation. That's why I picked it. They experience God as empowering them with a spirituality of resistance to dehumanization. As Prof mentioned earlier on, I have been part of the process of synodality, especially from the African continent, and then later on, I joined the Global Synod. These are questions that African women are bringing to the table, that we want to share whom God is from our experience as women. So if women do not join the theological discourse, this experience of God cannot be brought to bear. And this is what African women theologians seek to do. She continues by saying that the androcentric Bible and church have not been able to warp women's direct experience of God as a loving liberator. And it takes women to do that. And so, in my opinion, this captures a central theme in African women theology. And I've made an effort to read a lot of African women theologians, and I believe strongly that women are involved in the theological discourse on the continent, but from the point of view to say that we want to bring to the table the experiences we are making as women, what that means for us as women, but in fact, what that means for the whole world. So in Africa, when women are doing theology, they are not doing theology for women. They are doing theology for women, but for every other person. Because as I said recently in one of my articles, women in Africa are considered as a repository of knowledge and wisdom. And that can be explained further, and I hope we'll come back to it in our uh, other classes that we shall be having. Let's look at the question of social cohesion. In my, in my thinking, I'm just saying that we can see social cohesion, especially in the sense of Africa, as any process that serves to free humanity and the universe from alienations, such as destructions, chaos, poverty, violence, dismemberment of the human family in general. And that is what I see happening on the continent. On the continent, there's a lot of chaos. We have to be able to ask, where is it coming from? There's violence, religious conflict, ethnic conflict, intergenerational conflict. There is migration from Africa to most part of the global north, especially Europe. This is part of the chaos we are experiencing on the continent. And African theology should be able to answer some of these questions. And so I talk about social cohesion to say that African theology must be able to address the situations in which people find themselves in today on the continent. Therefore, African theology must speak to politics, to governance, to religious relations, and therefore be conscious that African theology can no longer just be Christian theology or African Christian theology, but African theology must also be inter-religious by nature, because that is the reality we have on the continent today. And in the seminars, we shall be reading one of my papers 
where I try to look at the dynamic of interreligious relations in an educational institution. Because my thinking is this, if we as scholars, we are in the educational institution and we are not conscious of religious diversity, how then does it trickle down to the other parts of the society? And we shall look at that into details later on. I hope to treat a whole topic on ecumenism and interreligious uh, relations on the continent. I also think that African theology must speak to the economic issues on the continent. As a theological ethicist, I have read a lot about Catholic social teachings. But today I teach in the university and I barely hear nothing about all those beautiful principles of the Catholic social teachings that we have in, in, in any of the courses that we teach. Not even from an African perspective, because we have all this pro principle of common good. For example, we don't use them. We don't have conversations around these issues and how they can help us. Migration, African theology should speak to it. And certainly we would agree that the issues of migration and immigration touches also the issues of international relations, the disparities that exist between the global south and the global north. African theology should be bold enough to speak to these issues for social cohesion, gender. And the issue of gender in Africa is becoming very complicated. I'm just coming from a conference in Bonn, and a beautiful presentation was done on gender that looked at um, uh, masculinities, different kinds of masculinities, how they are emerging and how they are helpful or destructive to society. But from a male perspective, this time not from a female perspective, it's getting complicated. I'll just give an example. The young boy is growing up in the same school with the girls and all the concentration is on girl child, girl child, girl child. And who is training the boy child? Because the girl child is going to grow and deal again with the same boy child. A young boy is growing and then nobody tells the young boy it is okay to cry. Rather, you hear comments like, why are you crying? Are you a woman? So the gender issues do not only affect women, in my opinion. And I think the African theology should be bold enough to also address these issues as they are and as they relate to the continent and hopefully as they relate to human reality in general and so many other issues that, that, that are linked to cohesion. In summary, when we talk of African theology today, the approach gives us about three um, prepositions, that first of all, African theology should be able to provide a clear and comprehensive dialogue between the African culture and the Christian message in a relation to the African faith. So issues of enculturation, if you like. Again, I'm not a favorite, I'm not favoring so much enculturation always, because I think that enculturation cannot be true without dialogue. And so I'm more for the, us to prioritize understanding African theology so that it can be dealt with from the perspective of other religions, especially the African traditional religion, in dialogue with them. Because it is only in true dialogue we can have true enculturation. Because if you do not understand my cultural perspective, how do we do enculturation? You are looking from outside and determining how it fits here or not. And it just leaves us with a lot of practical problems, even at the, 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 the faith communities. And we are still battling these things. And here I want to give practical examples. I better don't go to funeral. Let me use marriage. You are a young woman, meets a young man, you want to get married. In the Kasna culture, 
where I come from, I'm a Kasana by, by, I mean, by tribe. My ethnic group, we, we are called Kasana people. In the Kasana culture, there are procedures to follow. And that will be considered marriage. And the church wants to do enculturation. And it picks and chooses from outside that, okay, you can do this part, you cannot do this part. Because we think this part is evil. That conception of that particular part of the culture as evil is determined by who? The Christian worldview. Because there's no conversation, there's no dialogue with the culture to be able to ascertain, understand the concepts so that proper enculturation can be done. In my opinion, interreligious dialogue must be very, very relevant for a true African theology that will be relevant for the people. And thirdly, I'm saying that we need to also reflect on the praxis of Christian faith within the relatively deprived community and also among minority groups that exist on the continent. In my opinion, African theology cannot be true to herself if it does not do what I want to call situational or liberation theology. I like liberation theology a lot because, again, my favorite theologian, Laurenti Magiza, picks that up very well um, in the process. And I'm just going to quote from him, and I'm going towards the conclusion of my lecture, where I want to look at where religion, gender, and cohesion meets. And picking from Laurenti Magiza, he says that African theology has to rely on African worldview. And if a true African theology relies on African worldview, then it acknowledges that God and the role of the ancestors seek to establish a moral universe, which in effect would ensure the abundance of life for all human beings. Specifically, he says that if men claim dignity because they are children of God, how can they be ambivalent about the same claim by women? Liberation theology must deal with human beings, therefore. Their needs, their concerns, the situations they find themselves in. And I think I've come to the end of my lecture for this afternoon. However, for the students who are here, I would just want to keep in a few words about how we'll be proceeding for the next weeks. In the coming days, as I said earlier on, our course will aim to unpack African theology through the intersectional study of religion, gender, and social cohesion, which I uh, tried to give a general overview today and what I mean by some of the terminologies that I used um, in the topic. The main objective of the course will be to expose the students to authentic African theological thought in its historical context and pre present realities, considering most importantly, gender perspectives. And the more I delve into the topic, the more I want to also say that we shall consider just not just gender perspectives, but minorities and deprived communities in general. The course description. I'm saying that we are rooting this course on history. History because it is important for us to know where we are coming from, the pre-colonial religious worldview. What is it? Fortunately, I was born in a very small town, so I still have contact and I still benefit from those who are still living this pre-colonial system. And, and I'm very proud of that experience. And so I would like to share with you. It will explore the, um, in addition, we also explore theology as part of life, as praxis. So the question of what religion is that I talked to you about, we shall try to explore it. If in the African sense, we do not accept the word religion as it is used in contemporary scholarship, what then is it? Theology as praxis, part of life. And we shall look at the geopolitical 
context of such theology because it's, it has some nuances that we will have to look at and draw attention to some pre-colonial notions of gender, education, and social cohesion. What were the pre-colonial notions of education? I still meet young people who tell me that, well, we thank the white man because he has brought education to Africa. I'm like, okay, that's your opinion, but we can talk about that. And I want to talk about that. I want to discuss that with you. I hope I'm allowed. <laughs> yeah. Um, when we are able to finish with that, we shall try to look at um, development of theologies through colonial experience and realities of the people on the continent. And this will consist of the examination of historical interruptions, how language pro problematizes religion, and the contamination of the African worldview mindset as we have it today, the confusions of that worldview. What Kwame Bediako talks about the African identity in crisis. We shall try to delve a little bit into that and how they all led to the quest for this a stronger African identity and in fact the struggle for independence. They, they, they go together. So through the lens of what I want to call the myth of post-colonial Africa, call it a myth because yeah, the reality is a bit different. So the third part of this course, I aim to examine the journey towards the reconstruction or the construction of new identities. Uh, thus, this part seeks to help students to understand what new images are emerging from the African experience in history and in context. And I've mentioned some of them already when I was giving my lecture this afternoon. Ecumenism, interreligious issues. These are new images for the continent. How do we deal with them? How do we identify with them? How do we make them part of our theology, especially theology that has to be relevant for the people of the contemporary time? In addition, the section will also look at how the socio-religious, political, economic realities are at play in the theological and religious discourse on the continent. So briefly, this is what we'll be doing. And I won't bore you so much. Um, the themes that we'll mention next week, for example, we shall be starting with the worldview and spirituality in general. We shall look at the main themes like Ubuntu, Jamaa, Palava, and hopefully try to draw some education, gender, and, 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 and um, realities from this pre-colonial conception where the gender consciousness and what kind of gender consciousness existed in that pre-colonial time. Was there education? And what kind of education existed in that pre-colonial time? These are the things I want us to look at in the first part, and I hope that we can, we can move on with that. Then from there, we shall look at the, the conflicts and all that, that's our reality then. And then we, we can run away from it also. The expected learning outcomes, there are many, but I hope at least if you don't get everything, half. So it's my um, hope that when you complete this course with me, you will be able to engage in a discourse about African theologies and the historical perspectives of their development. You will be able to analyze African cultural heritage and its influence on Christianity, gen gender, and social cohesion. You will be able to discuss emerging theologies like black theology, liberation theology, interreligious dialogue, women, womanist theology, inculturation, and so on and so forth. And you'll be able to discuss the emergence of religious plurality as a negative force through the suppression of the indigenous religions. Here I'm going to make a case for the indigenous religion, especially those who still practice it, the African uh, indigenous religionists, because the issue here is that there are ma many times where Christianity and Islam become best of friends when it has to do with pushing down the African traditional religion, undermining the African traditional religion and its value of today. So when they have their own issues, it's, it's different. And I made a joke one day, it was not a good joke. <laughs> but the thing is that when they have issues of their own, and suddenly an issue comes and they have to come together in order to make sure that the African traditional religion is sidelined, it's okay. And so I asked myself, then in that case, why are we complaining about dominance? 
Because at one time, we accept religious dominance when it favors us, and when it doesn't favor us, we have complain about religious dominance. Religious dominance of any kind is always bad, and we have to be able to address that on the continent because we need to. It's time for us to do it on the continent. Um, also, to underscore the importance of dialogue, I've said that already, demonstrate understanding of what we mean by Africa today through the lens of identity, language, politics, and security or insecurity. Explain the socio-political reality of the nation state that colonialism produced in Africa and how religion plays out in such dynamics. A very complicated dynamic that I come from Ghana and my Kasana brothers are in Burkina Faso, and I just need to, early morning to take a stroll to Burkina Faso, and I need to cross a border. Who made those borders? Those are inherited borders. What are we doing with them? Theology should be able to speak to these issues. So we shall try to look at how we can have a conversation on these ones. Um, yeah, so basically this is it. You already have our lecture table, I'm not going to bore you on that, but for me, important is to talk about the seminar for the students. So we shall have seminars. In these seminars, students will be expected to read required text, make presentations, and lead discussions. It will be in groups, and the seminar presentation will be graded. The details of the seminar I've sent us already in the, the doodle, and then I need volunteers for the eighth. And then when I get a full list, I can then fill up the other rest, uh, list because if it's just by the corner, and so I'll just need volunteers who say, well, we can work on the if. The text is already on the platform for you, and so when I end, I'll be glad if I get at least four volunteers for the if. On this note, I just want to mention that the end of term kind of um, paper will be graded on a individual essay work based. So I'll give the topic ahead of time. When you are done, you can find a way of getting the papers to me through Prof or his, her team. And then I will grade them and hand over to them. Um, the focus for our next week would, as I said earlier on, would be African indigenous worldview and spirituality, and I shall try to talk to issues of Ubuntu, Ujamaa, and if time permits me, try to draw uh, issues of gender, education, and how they were found in such pre-colonial pre uh, theology. Thank you very much. Comments, questions, and concerns are welcome. Thank you. for introducing the topic. Thank you for um, presenting the expected outcome and uh, the seminar report. And also, um, perhaps you have noticed that there are still only the pink slides, but also the blue ones. So um, this lecture is combined with a block seminar, so which starts on uh, Friday. That is um, perhaps uh, important to know for those who, not, uh, who only want to um, join the lecture which is of course possible too. So um, we can discuss this details of teaching and uh, things later, I suppose, but you mm -hmm. may ask questions too. Mm -hmm. uh, but perhaps, uh, first of all, I may ask you to give some um, comments or ask a few fresh questions on the lecture, please. I'm uh, quite surprised that your presentation of the religious dialogue in Africa is meant towards the African uh, traditional religion. I myself, I think a lot of uh, the religious dialogue is uh, Uganda or generally in South Africa. Mm. And of course, it was a dialogue with Muslims. You never talked uh, about Muslims here. But of course, it's interesting that you will go towards the African traditional, traditional religion. Mm. But still, it's a bit unusual your approach. Yeah. Yes. I, I don't think I got you very well. But if I did, in, uh, coming from my experience from Ghana, when we talk of interreligious relations, interreligious dialogue, we mean Christians and Muslims. And that is a problem for the continent. And that's the point I was trying to draw at. That when we talk of interreligious dialogue, 
we should also include the African traditional religion because there are still practitioners of that religion. And that religion influences us, either Christians or Muslims, whether we like it or not. We pick from the expressions, we leave them, but we do not even understand them because we are interpreting them from the standpoint of Muslim or Christian because there's no dialogue. And so that was, that, that was the point I was trying to, to, to draw out. So I think at the end of the day, it's, it's, I have similar opinion with you that it's important for us to do interreligious dialogue, both Christian, Muslim, but now I'm just putting emphasis also on the African traditional religion. Yeah, thank you. Yes. I love that actually because I have a friend <coughs> from Senegal and he's a wrestler. Okay. And he showed me like uh, the docu documentaries of like people in Senegal doing wrestling. Yeah. And they're like um, <laughs> Muslim, yeah. but they have like a lot of spiritual like um, you know tra traditions that they do. Before, Spirituality. Uh, yes. Yeah, and it's like really interesting. Yes. Because they, they combine it. Yes. And haven't seen such such such, such a thing in Europe. So yes. <laughs> yeah. It's true. I love that. that that's a reality. Even you have people who are <laughs> Christians. But in one way or the other, influenced by the indigenous conception of religiosity. But to what extent do we understand how then we can live with those who still practice it? I come from a home. My direct auntie, the younger sister to my father, is a Muslim. Therefore, my brothers and sisters from here are Muslims. My uncle, who is currently sitting in front of my house because of the sad situation in the house, is a traditional religionist, practices the African traditional religion fully. Therefore, in this particular situation that I find myself in, to be able to move forward with this, uh, a good funeral for my father, I need to dialogue with my uncle, who is a traditionalist. I need to dialogue with my auntie's family, who are Muslims, for example. I have to be aware of this reality. And I come from a patriarchal system, and my uncle is a senior in the house, and he has a lot of say. <coughs> so I cannot come from my Christian point of view and say, this is how it should go. I'm doing enculturation. No, I have to dialogue, because that is also his brother. He feels responsible to his brother. That is an African worldview. And when he was alive, they related as brothers. They ate together, they took care of each other. I am because you are, was operating among them. And in African spirituality, in life, in death, you are part of the family. How do we navigate these realities with our dialogue? So I think it's, 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 a, it's, it's important, yeah. Yes. Yes, please. Thank you, thank you very much. I think that's a very helpful comment for me. But I think I mentioned in this particular lecture that the issue of African identity in crisis is acknowledged. And I'm not the first. <coughs> Kwame Badiako acknowledges it clearly and talks about the difficulty in even discussing African identity. Which identity are we talking about? the pre-colonial, the colonial, the post, the contemporary, and even in the contemporary situation, what is African identity? I, throughout this course, I think my task would be to acknowledge the complexity of it and hopefully unpack that. And my contribution to the discourse on African identity would be for us to know that there is no one singular African identity today. It is a, 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 a combination of issues that we have to be aware of. And so there, there has to be a kind of openness, not an exclusionary approach to African identity. That, that would be how I would be drawing yeah, at. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
the, the issue of gender is in Africa is a bit complex because the pre-colonial realities about gender are different from the historical interruptions that has caused gender issues today. There has never been a perfect gender situation on the continent. And I'm not going to claim that, not at all. However, there is a lot of disparity, and that is what I seek to gradually look into with the class. So for example, I can just go briefly for you. For example, in pre-colonial Africa, there were distinct roles of males and females. None of these roles were important, just that they don't crisscross. <laughs> so it's not as if the male roles were considered as the most important and no. Female roles are considered as also very important, equally important. Just that you cannot crisscross to do what the men are doing. The men too should not crisscross to do what the women are doing. But the question is what kind of roles were the women doing? And how does that help in our contemporary situation? Women, you cook, you nurture the home, you also help to nurture even the farms. So for the farms to be able to have food, it was the women. Today, commercialization is very important in our contemporary society. So the woman goes to work, the man also goes to work. Sometimes I even close later than my husband, <laughs> for example. And then I get home, it's still my role to do the cooking, the nursing. So there's an importation of what we're doing into a new system that makes it even more complicated for women on the continent. And we are saying that, please, can we have a conversation about these things? Now, when it came into theology, it came to theology when the women started doing theology on the continent, as I said earlier on. Mercy Oduyoye is one of the pioneers of female African theologians, and she started with that voice, clearly. That, please, can we have this conversation ongoing? But from an African perspective, and that's why I love her approach, she didn't take an approach of an existing Western feminist approach, but she said, look, our own situation and have the conversation going on. And that for me is very important because I think that gender issues in the West, in as much as they are same, they are also different from what we experience in, the, in, in, in Africa. For example, I remember reading it through a text with some of my students and one couldn't just believe how women could not vote some years ago in America, is that true, dog? And I'm like, yeah, it's true. He said, I can't believe that. Because he, in, 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 in his mindset, especially coming from the indigenous village systems that are still there, women also would have their own vote. Just that it might be done differently, different place, different with the men. And just like the men who cannot crisscross to do what they are doing, but that they cannot vote. It was like, oh, really? I said, yeah, that is true. So you see, the, the problems are the same, but at the same time, they are different. And so we have to look at the situation at hand, your context, and I always say context matters in, thing, in these discussions. And Mercy is very much aware of that. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>